as we open to James chapter 1 again, verse 13 today, we come after quite a lot of instruction in the book of James about trials, our trials, the trials the Lord brings our way, difficulties with all that has already been taught about trials. One may wonder what could James still have to say about trials at this point. So much has already been said. Could he really instruct us more? And the answer is yes. There's one more issue related to trials. One potential area of deception which often accompanies trials that James wants to make sure he addresses before leaving the topic. You see, James recognized what's true, and that is with each external pressure, each trial that we face, we get, with each unsolicited difficulty that comes our way in life, there is the flip side to the trial, and that's temptation. Temptation. Temptation also is a reality of life. Can't get away from trials. Can't get away from temptations. They're there. Temptation to do evil, to sin, to miss the mark with God, to fail morally. While we are being tested by God, that's a real possibility. So I wouldn't, in your mind, make too sharp of a demarcation between verses 2 and 12 and rolling into verse 13. James doesn't have a, a hard, fast kind of an outline, in my opinion. It is true, verses 2 through 12 sort of form brackets there with the topic of trial. But as we roll into verse 13, the same word for trial is, this, is the word for temptation. And so there's a sense in which we're getting the flip side of this here. Mostly... And if you think about this, this is true. When we as human beings face a real difficulty, something really hard, that along with that difficulty seems to come an increased number of those temptations. You lose a loved one. Boy, what a temptation. What a temptation if you lost a loved one. Or you fall ill and you get sick, face something you weren't counting on, you didn't plan on. Boy, what a temptation in many different ways. A financial crisis, not just a bad month, but I mean a crisis. You're faced with all kinds of struggles or a tragic accident, a false accusation against your character, and all of a sudden there's all kinds of things that are dredged up and you're facing them. I don't think we usually respond to those things all that well at first. I think often one of the first reactions is we fail morally. We have the trial and we give in to the temptation that accompanies it. Rather than being built up by the trial, we find out something wrong with ourselves and we stumble and we fall. In other words, we prove ourselves to be kind of spiritual weaklings. I will never deny thee, Lord, no matter what. That's what Peter said, surrounded by the apostles and Jesus at the Last Supper when everything was cozy and wonderful. And later that night he denied the Lord how many times? Three times, right? Same night, same night. We're wimps when it comes to this bully named sin sometimes. Just wimps. We don't stave off sin, or maybe I should say stiff arms since it's Super Bowl Sunday. We give in, we flop and fall. Okay, tackle me. We get lured away and we get angry. I'm using the word we, I just wanted to... Y'all recognize that. Sometimes I use the you when I want a lot of conviction. Sometimes I use the word we, and I want you to know I'm in the same boat as you. We have our lustful passion stirred up, and we're like, but I want that for me now. Jealous thoughts, crippling fears, bitterness, coldness of heart, depression, yes, even a ongoing kind of depression that accompanies trial. 
I want to just say, praise God for the Bible. As we're going through James, I hope you're seeing that in each of these verses, there is an awful lot of instruction. And um, I'm not lying when I say we could even go longer in each of these verses because there's so many ways to apply them to think through how they connect with our lives. I'm hoping as we get into more application as we're going through James that you continue to see that it connects to you. I just praise God for the Bible. It's, it's like this brilliant heavenly light that shines right into our souls, right? Into those dark areas of our minds and soul where we don't want to admit anything. We want to keep that kind of area for ourselves. And then we read God's word and all of a sudden it's, it's fearful but it's freeing as well as the light shines and we wonder why did I ever think that wrong way there it's the the last thing in the world we want to shine on the way we think on our inner thoughts yet when it shines we're like how wonderful that is why did I resist it kind of like kids being foolish with their parents the parents are just trying to help them the light rays bursting into our minds transforming our thinking illuminating dark areas and dispelling them quickly Did you know that scriptural truth is the best and highest kind of psychology? It is. Its analysis of your soul goes deeper and more exactly than anything else. It operates on the heart, cuts it open, Hebrews 4.12 talks about, penetrates to the deepest part of your life, your thought life. And it comes with the power of God. It comes with the precision of God. It comes with exactness. It comes with insight from the eternal one who made us. So that all the thoughts about, well, this is what's wrong with me, and this is what's wrong with me, and this is what's wrong with me, and this person shares their idea, and this book shares that. Put it all aside and listen to what God says. He knows better what's wrong with you. Let Scripture transform your thinking and find freedom in that. Scripture alerts us that lurking behind every trial that is sent from God to build up our faith, to make us stronger, is an ugly temptation lurking in the shadows to leap upon us, grab hold of us, and tear us down in sin. As anyone who's ever been through a tough trial knows, temptations always accompany stressful and hard and dire circumstances. When are we most tempted to be impatient and angry with others? When we're tired, when we're worn down, when things don't go our way. Yes? Isn't that right? You come in here, you're well rested. Everything's fine. Most Sundays, you're not angry. Put yourself in the pressure cooker and you respond differently, right? When are we most unkind in our responses to others? I'll give you the answers. When they're rude to us. Going along, you're having a wonderful day. Someone does something to you and like, boom, just comes out. I know because it happened to me yesterday. <laughs> Where did that come from? I want to get stuff done. That person is slow in front of me. Why does it be slow today? This is the day I've got great plans for lots of stuff. Person driving along is slower than slow. (laughs) I'm still recovering. (laughs) But I know what it is. I know what it is. It's me. It's my sin. When are we most covetous and unsatisfied? when we're flipping through a catalog or going through internet sites shopping, right? That's when we're most dissatisfied. When are we most fearful and lacking peace? Well, we're solid in our faith until we lose our job. Then we find out where our faith really is. Lose our insurance, right? When are we most bitter? When people have hurt us and they've been unfaithful. One after another after another. And you answer, and God doesn't remove the trial. So we become bitter, cold. But if that is so, and it is, what does that say about God who brought us the trial in the first place? What does it say about him? We did not ask for the trial. He gave the trial. If he brings the trial and then I sin because of the trial, isn't God partially to blame for my sin? After all, some reason... We would not have gotten angry or fearful or depressed if God had not allowed that trial in our life in the first place. It's him, you see. It's got to be him. So we might think. So that's the remaining question that James is trying to deal with. He doesn't want to leave this unanswered in this masterful discourse on trials. For how can we consider, verse 2, trials all pure joy? And how can we uh, focus on the eternal reward of verse 12, the blessing that we'll get, the crown of life, 
How can we have an unmixed faith in God without doubting, verse 7, if our minds are wondering, am I the only one to blame here? Or have I been set up? Are there divine forces working against moi? James realized that some who are weighed down with the pain of life and giving in to sin right in the midst of that situation might become deceived, often do become deceived, and that deception leads them to blame God, at least in part, at least in part. Man, that is where a lot of people are today, blaming God. You push them and push them to say what they really think about their, themselves and God and life in general and the way things have panned out for them. And you really get them to be honest and they say, why did God let that happen to me? Why did God bring that into my life? And behind that question and that tone is, it's got to be partially God's fault. And so notice in verse 16, beloved, the Spirit of God moved James as he's writing this epistle to write some very important words. Do not be deceived, my beloved brother. God is good, he goes on to write about after that. So we're in a section, verses 13 through 16, that wants to help us not be deceived by providing divine light. Let's read it. 13 to 16. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And he goes on to talk about the goodness of God and all the good blessings that come. Well, this is a brief section. It's very colorful, though. I think it serves two purposes. One, to indict sinful man that he is the cause of his own sin. He is to blame. The second is to defend God. God is not to blame. God is holy. God, he's good. He's holy, not to blame. This is a justification of God. Man, he is to blame. He's sinful. That's where the blame should be pinned. That's what the section is really saying. That's it in a nutshell. It is, in fact, a defense of God. Call that a theodicy, that which is a justification of God. A theodicy is a defense of the God of the Bible against accusers. A theodicy seeks to show that God is right and God is worthy of all praise and adoration. His judgments are correct and all of God's critics are wrong. That's what a theodicy does. A proper biblical theodicy simultaneously will uphold God as sovereign over all things, yes, even over evil, and the evil choices of men, and the evil choices of demons, yet he never advances evil, he never approves of evil. Rather, the theodicy would explain the universe this way. God is the creator of all things and he chose to create moral creatures with the capacity to choose good and evil. But evil itself is not a thing created by God. God did not create evil. Nor did evil create itself. Evil is not even a substance to be created. Evil is not like the dark side of the force, something that has always been there that can be tapped into and it's kind of eternal and ongoing in a dualistic kind of understanding like the Star Wars has popularized here. God did not create evil. Evil did not create itself. Evil's not a thing. Evil is not a thing to be created. Evil is the absence of a thing, as St. Augustine made so clear. Evil is the perversion, the corrosion, the disruption, the marring, the pollution of a thing, of good things that God has created. Evil is taking something good and messing it up. Evil is taking truth and twisting truth, and what do we call that? A lie. Lying is evil, but lying is not a thing. It's an absence of a thing. It's the absence of truth. Evil is taking love, which is gorgeous, wonderful attribute to have, and warping it and turning it into lust. Lust is not a thing. Love is. Lust warps godly desire into evil desire. 
Evil is taking worship, which is wonderful and essential, and ruining worship, and we call that idolatry. Idolatry is the impulse to worship God driven in the wrong direction. Evil is taking authority, which is God-given, and authorities are put into our lives to be helpful and, and abusing authority so that now it's turned into tyranny. Evil is taking joy, which is enriching to the human experience and unduly elevating it so high it, it crosses over into the realm of arrogance and pride and self-boasting. Evil is not the beautiful landscape. It's the ruining of the beautiful landscape. Evil is not the painting. It is the smudging of the painting. So listen. Evil always flows from the creature, the created one. Evil never flows from the creator, never. For evil is not creation. Evil is perversion of creation. God creates creatures pervert. Ecclesiastes 7.29 hints at this one. It says, Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. One way God made us straight, right, and good, and we found a thousand ways to pervert and be crooked. The sad reality is that human beings with their perverted ways of thinking have developed some self-contradictory arguments and used those arguments against God's existence or against God being good, all because evil exists. It even has a name. It's called the problem of evil. But arguments against God's existence and God's goodness are flawed at their very base. For in their pride, it renders them incapable of even challenging the assumptions that they have that maybe it's not God who's not there or God who's not good, but we who are not good. Man in all of his human education is already prejudiced against the truth, against seeing the truth about themselves before God. Humans will sooner find fault with God, particularly the God of the Bible, than with themselves. James knows this, and so James has to write this emphatically. He puts a section, he makes it clear so there can be no misunderstanding. Men are wrong. I'm writing this to vindicate God. Let's get our thinking straight. We can never legitimately pin the blame for our evil, our depravity, our moral failings on the Holy Creator. We cannot do that. When we try to stick evil and, and sin to God, it doesn't stick on Him. It sticks on us. It is on us. Now, James wants to provide some reasons to justify God here. Really, there are four reasons. This series, I'm going to cover three of them because I'm going to turn the fourth one into another series. But the, four three, the four reasons uh, are this. First, that God does not tempt anyone. That's the beginning part of verse 13. And then, interestingly, he says, secondly, God cannot be tempted by evil. And then he says, thirdly, and we'll get to this next week, Lord willing, man does a very good job of tempting himself. And so uh, verse 16 then is the exhortation not to be deceived by all the wrong thinking there. The fourth one really comes in verses 17 to 18, and that is you can't blame God because God only gives good things. So we really have four justifications for God. We have uh, four ways of defending God. God does not tempt anyone. God cannot be tempted by evil. Man tempts himself, and God gives only good things. We'll save that one for the next, the next uh, lesson. Let's just look at the first one here today. First, God does not tempt anyone. That's in verse 13. Look at it again, please. And look how clearly it's stated. Let no one say, look how emphatic that is. Let no one say when he is tempted. And this assumes that temptation will come. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. I am being tempted by God. Now we saw back in verses four through five a little bit of a word link between those two verses, just sort of a, a, a way in which James continues a thought or transitions into a new thought. And so there's a word link there between verse 12 and verse 13, and it's the word tempt with test. As we noted before, they're exactly the same word in the original Greek, parasmos. Only context can tell whether parasmos is a positive thing that God brings into our life we're to rejoice in, that is a trial, or a negative thing that is meant to tear us down thus translated a temptation. But they are different. A test we endure. Why? Well, we were told to receive the benefits of the test. 
A temptation we resist because we want to avoid its destruction. We must have completely different responses to these two ever-present realities in our lives. The two concepts are closely related, but they have a very important and key distinction. James separates them very abruptly and directly by saying, let no one say, when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. That's hard to misunderstand. A test, yes, God brings a test upon our lives. A temptation, no. Such a thought as God tempting us to evil is intolerable to a godly mind. A mind renewed by Scripture never says that, God's tempting me. That mind's too steeped in a godly way of thinking would never say that. James himself is abhorrent at the idea. You can see his personal response to this here, can't you? Let words such as these never be found on anyone's lips, and that implies also don't even say them to yourselves quietly. God's tempting me in your thought life. Don't let that happen. Don't let it come out of your mouth. Don't let it be what you think in your own head. Please notice again, end of verse 13. He says again quite plainly, God himself does not tempt anyone. No one who has ever been tempted has ever been tempted by God. That includes you and me. Being tempted by God with that preposition apo means more accurately being tempted from God or of God. In other words, the emphasis is on the origin of the temptation. Temptation is not from him, therefore it's not of him. So temptation certainly can't be done by him either. God does not directly or indirectly promote temptation. Not even the smallest degree does God tempt a person to sin. In fact, as we think about other scriptures, and some may come to your mind, God concerns himself all over the place with keeping the godly from temptation, doesn't he? When the disciples asked Jesus to pray or to teach them to pray in Matthew 6, 13, Luke eleven four, 4, Jesus said, pray then in this way. And one of the things he said is, lead us not into what? Temptation. Call that the Lord's Prayer. Deliver us from evil. We should pray to God that God would remove us from temptation. That's what God does. How about 1 Corinthians 10, 13? No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you may be able to endure it. 2 Peter 2, 9 piggybacks on that verse. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. More than that, God equips the believer, the believer in Christ, to have power over that pull and that lure of temptation. How does he do that? He gives us the scriptures. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He tells us the Holy Spirit is more powerful than our sin, and we get promises like Galatians 5, 16. I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Sure, the flesh is there. Sure, it has desire, but walk by the Spirit. You will not carry out its desire. Holiness, not sin, is what God wants from his children. Hasn't he made that so clear? First Peter. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. Be like me, I'm holy. That's what I want, that's what he said. So in every test that God provides a deliverance from temptation and power to combat evil. Why? Because he wants us to be holy. He does not want us to be sinful. So yes, it is true. God tests men. Some of you are going through a temptation right now. Or this past week, or the week before, you're going to be tested. God tests men. But God will never tempt any of us. Some examples also may help here. How do we differentiate these two? I think I like to get examples. It kind of colors it a little bit here. In John 6, 6, it's uh, the feeding of the 5,000. It's before the 5,000 are fed. You know the story. Philip didn't. Jesus turns to Philip. He was kind of the accountant. He was, he was skilled in planning things. And he says to Philip, I see these 5,000 out here. And by the way, it's probably just counting the men, so there's a bigger crowd than that. He turns to Philip and he says, Jesus says to him, Philip, uh, feed them. Imagine if you were Philip, you'd be like, uh, 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 uh. And it actually says there in John 6, 6, that Jesus said this to test Philip, to test him. Philip failed the test. Well, all we have is this bread and this fish. How are we going to feed this multitude? That's, a, that's craziness, Jesus. We're way out here in the wilderness. What are you talking about? What do you want me to do with this? 
And then he has them sit down, blesses the food, and he multiplies the loaves. No big, no big deal for, for Jesus, right? How about this one, Genesis 22, 1. It says, now this is long after Abraham has been walking with God. We'll get to chapter 22 of Genesis. Keep this in mind. God has been working with Abraham for a long time, and it says in chapter 22, verse 1, that God tested Abraham. Go take your son, your only son, go up Mount Moriah and sacrifice him there to me in worship. That is a test that Abraham passed. God didn't let him plunge the knife in Isaac. You know the story. He was held back from doing that. The ram was provided, but Abraham obeyed and passed the test of faith. Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, talks about God testing the whole nation of the Israelites out in the wilderness. It says, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you into the wilderness these 40 years that he might humble you, testing you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Wow, so that's what God did to the entire nation. Okay, so you may ask, if test and tempt go hand in hand, what really is the difference? God tests, he doesn't tempt. What's the difference? The answer is the intent, the intent. Evil intends to destroy. Evil intends to tear down. That's all evil can do. Because it doesn't have an existence on its own. It can only be a parasite. It can only latch on to something else and make its living off of what's good. Evil has no existence in itself. Good intends to bless. Good is constructive. Good is beneficial. Good builds up. Good accomplishes something. We even see that in the realm of work. It takes a long time to really put together something wonderful in your area of work, right? Sometimes it just takes a very short time for someone to come in and mess something up, right? Years and years and years, people work on a project, a plan, something they're trying to build, something they're trying to do with a business, and it can be ripped apart so quickly. That's true in the moral realm as well. Jesus said the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's evil. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. There's the difference. So we can say the Lord is trying me. The Lord is humbling me. But we must never say, the Lord is tempting me. But let me ask you something. I mean, what, what's the big deal about this? I mean, do people actually say this? Do people actually say, God is tempting me? I, around here, I don't know. I don't think so. People just come up and say, God was tempting me this past week. You ever say, I don't really hear anyone say that. So you're like, what's the big deal about this? Do people really say that? I, I want you to think with me, because yes, I think, I think they actually do say this in so many words. See, sometimes we know the words we're not supposed to say, so we don't say those words, but we say it a different way. And then we're like, did I say that? What did I mean by that? What you meant is, it's God's God's fault. And out there in the world, they really say it. In here, we sometimes say it. There are groups who insist they are not to blame for practicing their bad habit or some lifestyle, they can't help it. Well, if they can't help it, it must be God's fault. Who else is there to blame? Mom and dad, but it goes back to God. It is increasingly common to hear people blaming their genes, blaming their brain chemicals for very bad attitudes and very sinful actions. The Bible calls them sin. That is tantamount tantamount to accusing God of making them practice something that he utterly opposes. And too often the general populace, I think unfortunately some Christians as well, naively believe that science has proven these things. Let's just say a word about this. Every scientific study out there, every scientific study out there has assumptions. And if the assumptions that are carried into a study are not accurate, then the conclusions are not reliable. You have to know that. And they they act like their study is a scientific study and therefore this has been proven. If you really get into the field of study and you look at it, you realize there are all kinds of assumptions that are being made there about man, about his makeup, about what makes him tick, what he does, why he chooses what he chooses. Does he even have a spirit inside of him? Did the study even take that into consideration? How would a study take into consideration that a human being has as part of the component inside of them a spirit that interacts with their body? How would you even test that? 
What measurement would they use? They don't even acknowledge sometimes that there is a spirit inside of them and how that interacts with their body. It's not part of their science. We have to remember that uh, people with the same chemical makeup, the same upbringing, can and do respond to life differently. Obviously, there's much more at play here than biology. No sin is ever caused by the body. The body that you are given is good. We're not Gnostics here, people. The body is good. It's not material is evil and spiritual is good. God caused your body, and the body is good. He gave you your body. It's good. When Scripture speaks of the sinful flesh, that does not mean the body. The flesh that Paul in particular writes about. The Sarks is talking about a, a sinful fallen nature that is residing on your body, hijacking your body and driving it in a certain direction towards sin. The flesh is fallen. The flesh is sinful. Your body's not. God made the body. Just as the sinful mind is not exactly the same thing as the physical brain, the mind sits on the brain and the mind uses the brain, but the mind is not the same as the brain. Instead, the evil way of thinking hijacks the brain and makes it think the wrong way. We all know different people respond differently under the same kinds of upbringing. There are poor who look around and blame their upbringing and blame their surroundings and they turn to a life of crime and it's not their fault, what else were they supposed to do? And then there are poor who work very hard and care not about the unfairness of life and they work hard at school or a business or whatever they're good at and they succeed legally. There are those who have been abused as children and because of the abuse of children, they say, well, that's why I am the way that I am. I can't respond to this, and I can't do that well. And they've been told that by a scientist. But there are those who have been abused worse than they have as a child and learned God's grace, and it doesn't hold them back at all. In fact, it fuels their understanding of their relationship of God and the power of grace at work in them. You can imagine the Apostle Paul saying, God, why did you wait until I persecuted the church before you saved me? If you would have saved me before I persecuted the church, I wouldn't have been messed up the way I am. How could I possibly be an apostle now for your church? Look at all the people that are going to look at me, and I, I, I put to death these people, and they were in your church. Instead, he said that God showed grace to me so that in me God's perfect patience might be shown. See, it didn't hold him back from doing what God wanted him to do. In fact, it spurred him on. There are those who have a physical handicap and they get bitter at life. My arm doesn't work. My eyes don't work. My feet don't work. My lower half doesn't work. And then there are those who have handicaps and they do amazing things for God. Identical twins do not both grow up to be homosexuals. Think on that. Drunkenness can't happen unless you drink. Man has choices. Yet in so many words, people say, God set me up for this. That's why I am the way I am. It's not good language in church, but they think it. I'm being tempted by God. Frankly, we can all accuse God wrongly when things don't go well. Doesn't God know that I can't handle all these problems? Yeah, he can give me one or two, but I got like 10. It's too many. If he doesn't want me anxious, why did he bring so many of them on me? How can God expect me not to covet that other man's house and car when I have like nothing? I, I, my, my, and I've had nothing for a long time. How can God expect me not to covet? He should have given me a little bit more. Why did God let me bump into that tempting woman in the workplace? 
Doesn't he know I can't handle that? How can he expect me to attend church regularly when I have to work on Sundays to make ends meet? Oh, beloved, there is danger in thinking this way. Deception creeps in. Yes, it does. I like R. Kent Hughes' quote. He says, it is impossible to walk with God if we question his goodness. I wonder if some of you are not walking with God because you question his goodness. You're not excelling and growing in your Christian life because you're questioning his goodness to you. We will hide from God. We will avoid God's word, the Bible. We will get angry at God. We'll hold a long-standing grudge against God, but we will not put our hand in his hand and say, lead me, Lord. I want to go where you're going to take me if we think this way. There's some people know God is true. They know God's true. They know Christ is true. They may even know the resurrection is true, but they resist God anyway. Why? Because they think something like this. Well, if God wants me, he knows where to find me. It's his fault. He should have used me better in life. He put me on a shelf. God's promises don't work for me, maybe for that other guy, but he forgot me. God must not care about me. Boy, it just pins the blame right on God, doesn't it? Whose voice is that person listening to? Oh, he's listening to Satan's voice. So you don't think Satan speaks? There it is. It's right in that. How do we know? Because that's what the Bible tells us Satan speaks like, right from the very beginning. First time this guy showed up in a garden, right? As God said, God's words are really not true. Talking to Eve, right? You're not going to die. Let me tell you how it really is. Eve, God kept all the best stuff for himself, not for you. That's the way it really is. That's slander. Slander is such an evil thing. Eve says, well, maybe, maybe that's true. She goes, let in the sin. What is the message behind that voice? God's not looking out for you. God doesn't care about good things for you. God doesn't want you joyful. The best isn't for you. God's not looking out after you. That's what's behind that, right? He keeps the best stuff for himself. Reach out and take it for yourself. No one else is going to give it to you. Go for it. By the way, isn't this also how Adam thought, right? God shows up, wants an accounting. What have you done? And Adam says, we say he blamed the woman. He, he really didn't blame the woman. He blamed God, right? How did his words go? The woman you gave to me. What a lousy gift. <laughs> now before, it was, oh, she is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. <laughs> now, with the fig leaf, you know, the woman you gave me, she gave me this, this forbidden fruit and I ate. I mean, that's stupid, isn't it? It's your fault, God. Nothing's really changed. Man still passes the buck. All the fingers pointing away. Not even like that, where some are pointing back. It's just, it's everyone else's fault. A little bit here, maybe, a little bit here. But you don't know how bad it's been for me. You don't know how hard it's been for me. It's really about them. Some people even misuse the doctrine of predestination, if I might linger on this just a little bit longer. Predestination exempts you from responsibility, see? It's all predestined. It's all fixed. Is that really how the doctrine is supposed to be used? If God's fixed everything, why am I blamed? That is how a carnal mind works with this doctrine. You see the unsaved bring it up all the time. But the unsaved mind cannot even begin to probe the relationship between God's sovereign decrees as emperor of the universe and how those decrees work out through real, accountable, genuine choices of human beings. No one in all of church history has been able to explain that adequately. Predestination is a doctrine about saving foolish men from their own choices. They would keep choosing death and destruction, and so God has to choose something for them to lead them out of it. 
Predestination is not a doctrine to excuse men for making bad choices. Those who are not saved get exactly what they choose and what they like, sin. Blame shifting is such a huge part of our culture and society now. It's everywhere. No astute observer can deny it. It infects all of humanity. And they talk about the measles outbreak in California. <laughs> it's like, we've got an outbreak of blame shifting everywhere. When one guy blames another, it just spreads. Boom, 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 boom. Not me, not me, not me. Humans are very skilled at covering up the truth about themselves. Oh, and uncovering the truth about other people. It's amazing. That's called hypocrisy, by the way. It's not just presidents and senators and CEOs who live in the spin zone. It's the common guy out there that does it too. People at work, boss blames them, they blame their workers next to them, their colleagues. Kids at home blame the parents, not themselves. Amen? But parents blame the kids, not themselves. And husbands blame the wife, right? Turf all. Oh, and wives blame the husband. Am I right? You remember President Harry S. Truman? I was literally on his desk in the Oval Office. He said, you know, the buck stops here. Not, not anymore. The buck is just passed on everywhere. Not my fault. Not me. Don't blame me. It's amazing the excuses people come up with. But if we think that way, we really are passing the blame somewhere ultimately. And if we think about our thoughts, it might just go back to God. He's at fault. Now that is just not acceptable thinking. And James wants to press the point a little bit. We get started with the second point. We won't finish it. Notice uh, again in verse 13, the second justification for God. God cannot be tempted by evil. This is amazing. God cannot be tempted by evil. And it starts with the word for, so that explains the reason no one should say that God tempts them. God would not tempt anyone for he cannot even be tempted by evil himself. Not tempted expresses a verb, a parastas, untempted, not tempted. Now you might be wondering in your mind, what's the connection to our temptation? It's simply this. God would not tempt anyone to evil because evil itself has no sway over him. Evil does not influence God. He's not under the control of evil. Evil does not control God's thoughts. Evil does not control God's decisions. So he has no reason whatsoever to try to advance it or to listen to it. There is no evil coming into God, and so there can never be any evil coming out of God, nor would God want anyone else to do evil. It's not even possible for God to be tempted by evil, much less to give in to it. It's interesting that in the book of Sirach, also called Ecclesiasticus, not Ecclesiastes, but Ecclesiasticus, one of the uninspired but sometimes helpful books of the Apocrypha, written during the intertestamental time. It says in chapter 15 of that book, listen to this, and I imagine that James had read this, do not say it was God's doing that I fell away, for what he hates he does not do. Do not say he himself has led me astray, for he has no need of the wicked. In theology, we call this the doctrine of the impeccability of God. There is actually one thing God cannot do. God cannot sin. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. God cannot lie. He not only can't sin, he can't even be tempted to do sin. God is untemptable, and therefore God tempts absolutely nobody. Evil and God are mutually exclusive. I like Dr. John MacArthur's quote. He says, God and evil exist in two distinct realms that never meet. He has no vulnerability to evil and is utterly impregnable to its onslaughts. He is aware of evil but untouched by it. Like a sunbeam shining on a dump is untouched by the trash. I like that. What a glorious Lord God in the heavens we worship and serve. Holy and undefiled. None of us have ever defiled God by our sin. 
Compare for a moment the true and the living God to the false gods of other religions of Paul's day, the gods of the Romans and the Greeks, just for example. They would not only incite humans to engage in sin, but they would indulge in gross immoral activity themselves. Zeus, the chief god of the Greek pantheon, was a conniving trickster and engaged in many illicit affairs with mortal women. And then there were jealous gods like Hera, often spying on Zeus. These days you're getting all these ancient gods, these false gods that are being depicted on television and they're becoming popular and all of that. But look at their character, they're pathetic. The true God of heaven, the maker of the ends of the earth, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind is purely lovely and holy. That's why we have so many verses in the Bible that say things like, who is like thee among the gods, O Lord? Who is like thee, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? Exodus 15, 11. Those who say that all religions are the same are willfully ignorant of the God of Christianity. No religion has the same God who is always holy and always speaks the truth as the God of the Bible. Really, a person's religion starts with their concept of God and if the concept of God is different, then the religion is different. Where is there a God in all the other religions who is a God like the God of the Bible? Like Habakkuk 1.13, Thine eyes are too pure to approve of evil, and thou canst not look on wickedness with favor. Boy, you want a strong apologetic for the Christian faith? When you're out there and you're talking to unbelievers, just start telling them what God is like. They've never heard of a God like that. How wonderful a character he is. Just start extolling it, his radiant person, all the characteristics that he has. The jaw just drop open. Who is like that? Who would resist a God like that? It would be to commit suicide forever and ever. It's irrational. Those who come to faith in Christ are those who first consider Christ and they look upon him and they look upon his followers and they see a difference. They see an excellence of character. They see integrity in living. They don't find that anywhere else in the world. God is pure. God is uncompromisingly holy. He never tempts to sin, ever. I say, what a profound vindication James is presenting here of God in just a few words. God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. Nevertheless, temptation is real. Temptation is not imagined. And so next time, we're gonna look at, well, who does the tempting? Where does it come from? How do we get it? And we'll find out that we do a pretty good job of tempting ourselves. And we're going to pray now, get ready for the Lord's Supper, and consider the blessedness of being cleansed from sin by our Lord. Thank you for being our holy God. Cleanse our hearts and our minds and our thoughts as we come to you. Let us be drawn with excitement to holiness and obedience and not see it as a mere religious weightlifting duty, but a joy that your commandments are not burdensome. And when we come to you, Lord, you lift our spirits. You bring to us joy if we would but trust you and obey you. Bless us as we worship and commune with you through your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Please stand with me.